Okay, this month we are going to look at a relatively new library in Boost called Boost Cobalt. And this is designed to give you the easy use of coroutines for asynchronous operations. And it, uh, when I say easy, it aims to be on a par with asynchronous operations in Node.js or in Python. Uh, we saw last month the details of, of coroutines, at least not every single detail, but enough to get going. And there's a lot going on there. And in order to make that easy, Cobalt does a number of things. And um, in order to make things easier, there are some choices that Cobalt makes for you that are different from what we saw last month implementing coroutines on our own. And w one of the things that we were doing last month with a hand-rolled coroutine is we were basically using the lowest level facilities. And although we implemented a generator, we didn't implement a generator conforming to, you know, like the concept of a generator. We just had this coroutine and we would ask it if it was still running. And if it was still running, we would ask it to give us a value. And then it would do a co-yield to return a value back to us. And that kind of coroutine in Cobalt is, is a generator. But Cobalt has a couple other kinds of uh, coroutine. They call them coroutine types, and I don't want to confuse that with the return type. It actually it, it is the return type of the coroutine function. So we saw last month that these coroutine things, they're a little weird that they, you write this coroutine function, and it returns a type, and that is the type of the client API. And then buried inside that type is a nested, the name of a nested type called promise underscore type. And that's the type of the promise. And so what um, Cobalt does for you is it basically takes care of implementing that promise type. And uh, the promise type has those member functions, as we saw last month, that determine, you know, when does this coroutine yield and how does it handle values that are uh, returned from co-yield and what happens when you do co-return and so on. Uh, so Boost Cobalt aims to try to make that simpler with some different coroutine types, promise, generator, task, and detached. We'll, lo we'll look at um, we're not going to look at detached in detail. We're going to look at promised generator, promise generator, and task. And then, really, I think the, the main benefit from the Cobalt library are these synchronization functions. So, if you've ever done any um, Node.js, you know, kind of asynchronous code, there's a great library for Node.js called async and it lets you do things like like start a bunch of asynchronous things and the, you know give me the answer from the first one that completes and the first one to complete implicitly cancels all the rest or let me start a bunch of asynchronous operations and block until they've all done something or uh, It, 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 so, in, in that async.js library, there's there's different ways that you can combine these uh, asynchronous operations together like that. The synchronization functions in, Bo <coughs> excuse me, Boost Cobalt are uh, not as rich a set of combining operations as uh, async.js, but they're sufficiently rich enough that you can do all the kinds of common things you want to do and you can build your own synchronization function using these lower level synchronization functions from Boost Cobalt if you need to do something more sophisticated.
so um, race uh, it waits for one coroutine out of a set to be ready in some unspecified way and that basically means you're going to start a whole bunch of asynchronous operations and the first one to say I'm done or I have a value that's the one that wins the race uh, so this is kind of like any of uh, you can think of it as like stood any of but for a set of uh, uh, asynchronous operations uh, join takes a set of coroutines and waits for them all to complete or um, if one of them throws an exception it cancels the remaining uh, asynchronous operations that are still pending um, and, and it returns a single exception for the whole set whereas gather returns uh, all the results of all the coroutines and it can capture an exception for each of the individual asynchronous operations so say maybe you were gonna fetch 10 web pages asynchronously and even if some of them throw an exception because the host is down or something like that or that it's network unreachable what have you you still want to get the results of the others um, and then left race it's really just uh, because we said for race the asynchronous operations are evaluated in some unspecified manner um, but you'll notice that he says uh, in the documentation here they're evaluated in a way to avoid starvation whereas uh, if you want to execute a sequence of operations asynchronously but you want them executed in a deterministic order so in a specified order you can use left race but that can result in uh, starvation of whatever's waiting for this left race so that that's available to you if you want to if you need that fancy business you can do that but um, probably most of the time you use race or join and if you need more uh, specific error information for each specific asynchronous operation you use gather um, there's also a couple of utility um, concepts here this channel you can think of a channel as a way to send values between coroutines uh, we won't, <coughs> won't look into the details too much of I mean it's covered in some of the examples here but we won't look into the too much of the details of channel uh, with is um, an RA RAII helper so resource acquisition is initialization that allows asynchronous teardown when when exceptions occur so if you threw an exception and you had a resource that you were holding in one of your asynchronous operations the exception you know suppose you were doing a join and one of the operations throws an exception well you want the other pending asynchronous operations to shut down cleanly so that's that's what uh, this with utility is for so um, we're just gonna take a scan through the documentation pretty quick now this is a new library there's I did notice some like minor typos in the documentation and the author here uh, Clemens Morgenstern I, I don't think English is his first language so sometimes the grammar reads a little bit awkward it's not that it's incorrect or it's not that it's a poorly formed sentence it's just not idiomatic what you would say if you were a native English speaker speaker but otherwise the documentation is fine um, it's maybe a little bit terse in a few places um, I did run into a few little problems uh, which I kind of wallpapered over but we'll see that when we look at the code that I wrote um, and I, I think this documentation would benefit from more examples around all of the um, different features in the library he's got he's got some examples so it's not like there are no examples but uh, some of the examples tend to combine like a bunch of complex things all together into one example and while that's good from the point of view of it being a more realistic real-world example it's also bad because it's hard for me to see um, how a feature is used in isolation in a in a in a simple 
manner before I look at, you know, a more complicated version of it. But those are our uh, quibbles, not, you know, causes to fail this library. Um, and as uh, he says here, the idea is to provide single threaded asynchronous operation similar to what you get in Node.js or AsyncIO in Python. So, last month when we talked about, you know, the full breadth of what you could do with coroutines, it was mentioned that you could do coroutines on multiple threads, but the typical use case for doing this uh, asynchronous operations is to have multiple coroutines in flight on a single thread. That there's not to say that you can't use boost cobalt with multiple threads, but the goal is simple, single-threaded, asynchronous programming. And again, if you've ever done any Node.js asynchronous I.O., um, it's surprising how much asynchronous stuff you can have in flight and basically with IO operations going out to disk and things like that or going out to the network with those operations being slow it's amazing how much stuff you can get running concurrently even on a single thread um, I, I've done some Node.js code that like would recursively descend through our source tree and read every file looking for to-do comments and try to match those to-do comments up with like an open issue in our uh, task tracker to make sure that all our to-do comments which represent work that we said we wanted to do later but we haven't done yet make sure that those were all tracked in our little tool that we we're using to track all of our pending work and you know it's thousands and thousands so thousands and thousands of lines of C++ source code and you know hundreds and hundreds of files across you know a whole bunch of different directories and I was surprised at how quick Node.js could just scan through all that stuff and uh, the amount of you know it's really a single thread so it's not true concurrent operation but due to the number of the huge number of IO operations Basically, we're keeping the CPU busy, even though we're doing tons of I.O. So it's blocking I.O. that really kills you in an application that's trying to get, you know, the most concurrency going on. Um, so, uh, and again, this the promise word is a little bit, it's overloaded yet again. So we have stood promise in the standard library. That's not where we're talking about. We have the promise underscore type nested type inside your function, in, inside the return value of your coroutine function. And that's also now what we're talking about. This is the cobalt promise uh, up here, which is just an eager coroutine that ha you know returns a single result. So you have some asynchronous function that does co-return co -return on a value uh, of some type. So that's his promise inside. That's what a cobalt promise is. A cobalt generator is the only type of coroutine and cobalt that can have co-yield in the body of the, of the uh, coroutine function. Uh, operation wrappers, we won't talk much about that. There, there's the scope of this library. Uh, it's fairly broad. It does make some policy choices that make it narrower, narrower in scope than the low-level promises we looked at last month. But I, there's not going to be time to cover everything. We don't want to talk all night. So, um, And uh, he's giving us this uh, race combining primitive and a channel for a way to communicate values between coroutines that are um, executing, you know, concurrent asynchronously. I guess the right way to say it. Uh, so, um, just a little. He goes through in the documentation a little coroutine primer. So this is all the stuff that we talked about last month, where you've got uh, this is the synchronous version of a function that does an HTTP GET. And um, here's one where he's, it's still synchronous, but he's running it on a separate thread, and then he's doing a thread join. 
and then here is the cobalt version where you see the here's our promise function and the return type sorry our coroutine function and it returns a cobalt promise that returns a single value of type std string so it takes a URL does an asynchronous read of uh, an a, you know using an HTTP request over the network so when we looked at how to do this with boost beast we saw that there's actually a bunch of asynchronous operations that are going to take place first we have to take the host name out of that URL and resolve it down to an IP address and we have to take that IP address and we have to connect a socket on the port for HTTP or HTTPS depending on the protocol of the URL we have to get that socket connected and then we have to start reading so first it's since it's HTTP which is a request response protocol so first we're going to build our HTTP request we're going to write that over the socket which may involve multiple write operations because we may not be able to send all of the data for the request in a single write operation so we have to kind of wait until the socket is ready to accept more data and then send some more data maybe it will still wouldn't let us complete the, all of the data in the request so there's multiple uh, potentially multiple write operations to get the request sent to the remote server and then we're gonna have to read the response back from the server that's gonna involve potentially multiple asynchronous read operations on the on the socket and then uh, in this example it's just returning it as a string the body of the response HTTP re requests and responses have a header and a body and, and in this case uh, we're just going to get the body from the response and return that as a cobalt promise with a value of std string and you can see here he's uh, in his example he's doing a get on two URLs and this double parenthesis here is just a typo so just be aware of that uh, I opened a bug on it they haven't fixed that in the mainline documentation yet but it's just a minor typo just so you're aware so we're doing a cobalt join we're gonna fetch two URLs asynchronously <coughs> and overlap that execution you know so that whenever data is available on either one of those HTTP connections we're going to be reading that and otherwise we're just waiting for data to come in and then he's using a uh, uh, structured binding here to get the result of the join so this is the string from the first get and this is the string from the second get and I, I haven't mentioned it yet, but obviously since coroutines are a C++20 feature, this is a C++20 library. So if you are building Boost yourself, although with package manager support these days, I don't know why you would do that, but if you're doing that, make sure you build Boost with C++20 support turned on. Otherwise, you won't get the Cobalt library. And then it's just going to you know print the two strings that came back from the two fetches. Um, <coughs> this is the stuff we talked about last month co return co yield co wait these are the basic asynchronous primitives that you can have in your coroutine functions um, and we're gonna skip down here we talked about awaitables the awaitables are uh, technically an, an awaitable is a type that can be passed to co await but there's also a way for a type to be mapped to an awaitable either with the um, operator co-await on your class or you can do it through there's also a way to do it through a type traits mechanism this lets you adapt types that you can't modify to turn them into awaitables um, now cobalt depends on boost ASIO the asynchronous IO library and it, it the, the dependency is such that it will use boost ASIO by default in order to get an event loop because uh, in 
you know, for instance, in Node.js, the event loop is just kind of hidden. It's inside Node.js itself. And same with, uh, I believe, I haven't done any synchronous programming in Python, but I believe it's the same in, in Python, that the event loop is implicit. But in a C++ application, it has to be explicit. And when we looked at Boost ASIO libraries, uh, it was probably like six months ago, a while ago, we saw that we had to get an IO context from ASIO and call run on the IO context in order to pump um, events into ASIO and get the event handler, get our asynchronous handlers invoked as uh, events came in that woke them up. And you can certainly cook up your own IO context and your own event loop, and you can use that with Cobalt. However, Cobalt um, provides a an implementation of main and an asynchronous enabled function called co underscore main. It's just a function that's provided by Cobalt. Uh, I mean, the main function is just provided by Cobalt in that case, and you write instead of writing your own main, you write your underscore you write your own co underscore main. Uh, and here's an example of that. This is the, the simplest thing you could do with Cobalt. So we've got our asynchronous co underscore main function. We're doing a co return zero. This is a little deceptive. Um, the, the, re the return type is cobalt main and when you go look in the the header files that implement these classes you see that cobalt main is constructible from a pointer to a promise not an integer so it's a little bit weird uh, when we get to my example with the my JSON comics database you'll see that um, you can do this code return zero, uh, and and it, it will work out all right. But like I, I think initially I when I was transforming my main function and trying to make it a co main function, I had some places where I was returning a number, and and I needed to make them co return for it to work out right. Um, it it does turn out to be the case that even though this main is constructible from a pointer to a promise, there's some other machinery going on that results in this return value getting communicated as the return value of main. Um, there's also a cobalt thread that you can use for um, operating or executing asynchronous operations on a thread <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, a task um, is uh, you can think of like a task as it's it's like a asynchronous function that doesn't yield a value. Uh, well, in this case, it's yielding it's not yielding a value. It can yield a value, but with a, with a task, it doesn't. Um, start executing any code doing any operations until you get it started and so here they're uh, using this cobalt run function to run a task and that essentially turns this asynchronous operation it becomes synchronous in as a result of this run call so when you call run when run returns all the asynchronous operations will have completed. Uh, there's also a way that you can do a spawn to get the task uh, set up but not yet started. So in this case, the asynchronous operation, whatever is inside your coroutine function, it begins operating right away, begins executing right away. But if you spawn, you can um, spawn it off so that it hasn't started doing anything yet until you call run on the ASIO context. So uh, there were these um, three basic ways of doing coroutines, as promises, tasks, and generators. So the first one he recommends is just like it should be your default 
go-to coroutine type. So you think of it as, I'm going to do some asynchronous operation. It may depend on other asynchronous operations, but I'm going to um, yield a single value. So here's the coroutine function. Its API type is cobalt promise parameterized on int because it's going to co-return an int. But in the middle, in the meantime, it can co-await on other things. Um, this do the thing could return a value, and that will be the return value of the co-await expression here. So it's not that you can only uh, you can only have a single uh, value yielded by this kind of coroutine. <coughs> and it's typically going to be a co-return. Well, it's always going to be a co-return statement. You're not going to do co-yield inside this cobalt promise. Uh, if you do, it's undefined, so don't. Um, but this is the simplest kind of way to set up some asynchronous stuff. And then he's got a co-main going on where you construct a promise. And in cobalt, promises... Uh, I think it's everything. Yeah, in Cobalt, every, every coroutine is eager by default. When we looked at how to do it low level last month, we saw that you could have your coroutine suspended immediately as soon as it was started. And if you need that behavior, there's a way you can get it in Cobalt, but it's not the default. So in Cobalt, as soon as you call this function, the coroutine function for this promise. It's going to execute whatever code is in your coroutine function up until the first point where it could suspend. In this case, it's the first statement because it's a co-await. You could be waiting on that other coroutine. So uh, as soon as this line of code executes, we've executed everything inside the coroutine function for a promise up until the first point where it could suspend due to a co-return or a co-await. And um, here, inside the co-main, they're waiting on this other asynchronous operation. And then they wait for the promise to complete. So that gets us down to here. And then it's going to take the whatever that return value was from this promise function, and it's going to end up returning that as the asynchronous result of co-main. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I misspoke. Promises are eager. Generators are eager, but tasks are lazy. So uh, a task doesn't do anything until you co-await on it. Sorry. Oh, look, this is another typo here. This should be co-await, not co-wait. Um, so constructing a task, it's initially suspended. It hasn't done anything yet. Wait for some other asynchronous operation, and then wait on the task to get its return value, and then, again, bubble that out from co-mate. Um, generators and promises are both eager by default, they can be made non-eager, lazy, uh, if you wish. Um, so unlike a promise or a task, which returns a single value via co-return, a generator can return multiple values with co-yield. So here, you know, it's just a generator that's just going through a loop, and it's going to asynchronously yield each value from the loop and then it's going to asynchronously yield uh, asynchronous synchronously return 10 at the end of uh, at, right before the generator exits and um, here as soon as you create the generator because it's eager it's going to run all the code up until the first suspension point which in this case is a co-yield so as soon as you call this function, it will have already executed everything up to the first co-yield. So in this case, it will be a co-yield of zero. And 
uh, there's an implicit conversion of bool on generators, cobalt generators, to let you know if um, it's not done yet, so you can call co-await to get a value out of it. So basically, this uh, while g here is saying as long as this coroutine is still running, um, it hasn't yet exited out of the bottom of the generator function, or the uh, coroutine function, rather. So as long as we can still ask it for a value, go ahead and ask it for one. And then um, this co-main, it's going to do a co-return zero out of there uh, to, to bubble out the return value of whatever main is going to be for, you know, the C runtime. Um, and here you see that, I mean, this was a generator that didn't take any arguments. But a generator can take an argument. And in that case, you can... It, it, it's kind of goofy here. I'm, I, you know, I, I had to wrap my brain around this at first when I was reading it in the documentation. Here we've created the generator by passing in a value of 5 for value. And then here we're passing in new values as we do a co-await. So it's kind of weird that like the 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 five that got pa you can think of it as like this five that got passed in that was what was used for the beginning of this generator up until the first suspension point. So the value here got the value of five. So five was not equal to zero. So it said this local variable got the result of 5 times 0.1. Uh, I'm not sure why he's doing 0.1. This doesn't seem like... The, it's the, oh, the, I see. So the co-yield has a type of whatever this expression is. So value times 0.1, this is a double. The int gets promoted to a double. So we get 5 times 0.1, which gives us the yielded value of 0 0.5 but then value here is declared as an int so when we take 0 0.5 and assign it into this local variable now it gets truncated to an integer and so now it's 0 so this while loop exits and then it will return as its last value a quiet nan of type double. Now he had to he had to do this explicitly parameterized on double because this expression yielded a double. So I think it. Uh, I was reading that it's it's like undefined. Well, it's not undefined behavior to have co yield return one type and co return return another type. There's ways that you can handle that by adding. Uh, member function overloads into the promise type, but for cobalt, because the promise type is being generated by the framework, we don't have that full control over that nested promise type. We can't add our own functions in there. So uh, this is saying the return type of the generator, the, the type of the expressions it's going to yield is a double, but it's accepting a, a parameter of type int and that lets us, so the first one we pumped in a value of 5, now we're pumping in a value of 4. Th this example would be better if he pumped in a value that was bigger than 10, so that this loop would execute more than once. Um, but as you say, it's a young library, so there's still uh, improvements that could be made to, you know, because it, this while loop is essentially not doing anything because of the values that he's used in his example. They're all less than 10. So when the double is truncated to an int, it'll always be 0, and that loop will only execute once. Um, but this is a way that we can get context communicated into the generator so that we have dynamic values being passed into the generator as we're pumping it for new values as opposed to just whatever uh, 
context was injected when the first call of the coroutine function was made. I hope that's clear. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of messy to talk about. Um, now, if you want a lazy generator, basically what you do is you just put a, 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 an initial co-await to get a synchronization point in the beginning that will you know uh, automatically suspend the coroutine. Uh, when we wrote our own promise type, we had our generator uh, suspending at the very beginning. Um, this is in the namespace boost cobalt this underscore co row, and then the type of the awaiter is called initial, and it's he calls it a pseudo keyword in the documentation. There are several different awaitable uh, pseudo keyword awaitables that you can uh, use as an argument to co-await um, <coughs> to get uh, in this case he's doing it to get a suspension point but it's also a way that you can kind of ask cobalt for particular information about the implementation for instance you um, I mentioned that we're using the boost ASIO uh, event loop and in boost ASIO there's a concept of a thing called an executor and sometimes you may need to get access to the executor there's a pseudo keyword that you can co-await on and when you do that the return value of the co-await expression is the executor so you can get access to the executor we also talked about how uh, last month, pardon me, we also talked about how you can control how the coroutine stack frame is allocated. So because a coroutine does not share a stack with the main threads stack, it has um, a chunk of memory that is allocated in order to hold the stack frame for the coroutine function and by default uh, cobalt will provide an allocator it will allocate an AK chunk of memory for allocating the stack or, or the, the, the call frame used for your coroutine function if you need access to that allocator there's also another pseudo keyword that you can co-await on that will give you ac give you back the allocator so that you can allocate memory in that chunk that's used for allocating the call frame for the coroutine function. Um, here's an example of <coughs> how we're doing a join. In this case you've got one promise that returns an int, another promise returns a double, and when we join on that we get a tuple of int and double. In the previous example where we saw <coughs> it was using a uh, uh, why do you always draw a blank I'm trying to think of that the, the uh, deconstruction square brackets to get access to the two types <coughs> here he's just written it out explicitly um, uh, here's an example of doing a race um, He's got two, in this case, two generators, and he's going to do a race on the two generators, and you mm. you get back a variant and <coughs> evaluating that variant will tell you which. Uh, index you need to use to get access to the one that completed right because a race it's just the first one that completed okay so he's got a fairly decent tutorial here um, but what I want to do now he, he, he's got a tutorial where you know here's just a basic our asynchronous thing is just gonna wait for a timer to expire is just using uh, timers from 
ASIO is just going to async weight on those. And here you see um, use of that pseudo keyword to get access to the executor so that you can, uh, this gets you the executor that's being used by Cobalt. So you can pass it over to ASIO so that they're using the same executor. Um, he, he does a simple echo server. When I, we'll, we'll look at the, I've got the code for these off in Visual Studio, but we'll just kind of skim over these in the documentation first. Um, now this one, I don't, I'm not on Unix, I don't have WSCAT. So this one I got, when I tried to execute it on Windows, I got a, a, something about like it couldn't upgrade the web socket, it was missing the upgrade token. I have a feeling it's because I was just trying to get at it from my web browser. I was using WSCAT, which is WebSocket Cat. So when the client connected, it didn't have the right handshake to be able to upgrade the connection from HTTP to a WebSocket connection. So I wasn't able to run that locally. But basically the idea here is um, it's going to... So this is uh, localhost 8080. That is what is... The, the port on the local machine that this client, this price ticker client, is it's listening on port 8080 for connections. And then in the URL, it's, it's going to go and get the price of uh, Bitcoin in USD, US dollars, and then dump out the value uh, back to the, to the, uh, the client. And so this is an example of all that machinery of we got to get uh, a remote URL and we got to take that URL. We got to look up the host name. We got to get the IP address and then we got to connect to it. We have to make sure that the HTTPS connection is running to talk to this remote machine that that's got this data. You know, the data isn't local. We're using a local server to go fetch it from a remote server and give it to us locally. The the uh, Boost Cobalt program is the local server that's going to go and get this from the remote machine, the remote endpoint. It's going to go and uh, use some kind of WebSocket API uh, to report that back. And so we have to take HTTP connections or HTTPS connections. We have to upgrade them to um, WebSocket and there's all that I.O. going on. So, in that example, everything is done with uh, asynchronous I.O. using Boost Beast, ASI, Boost ASIO, uh, and Boost Cobalt to get the necessary information. Here's where, you know, this uh, ws.blockchain.info is the remote site, and then this is the uh, WebSocket API, you, are, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I guess exchange.blockchain.com, and then this... Uh, async handshake is boosting it back up, boosting the HTTPS connection to a WebSocket connection. And uh, this is the API endpoint for the WebSocket API. Um, and it's going to have to read JSON from the remote end and convert that into something that it can spit out locally and so on. So, um, again, more this is very similar to what we looked at when we talked about Boost Beast and how to do HTTP requests using um, Boost ASIO uh, and Boost Beast. It's just that now every all the, instead of um, maintaining things through callbacks and uh, posting events into Boost ASIO, we are using asynchronous callback functions and sorry, we're using asynchronous coroutine functions and doing co-await on them to get the the result. Um, delay op, I'm going to skip over. Let's see. Okay, so he these examples I brought over into the project that I created. So just go look at that. So I'm using VC package, um, and 
<coughs> that implies that I don't necessarily have, you know, the entirety of boost on my machine. So I'm going to be picking up whatever dependencies those examples have on other libraries from VC package. So the way I did that is I had a feature in my manifest called Cobalt Examples and if that feature was on then it brings in additional dependencies needed by the examples. Um, if that I think I didn't test turning off the feature uh, so it probably will fail to build if I because I think I unconditionally built the examples but um, this is just a way to I just want to show you how to take portions of your code and if you got like a bunch of complicated dependencies and you don't want those all the time you can use this feature mechanism in the VC package manifest and um, even though I copied over his CMake lists from his uh, boost repository, a bunch of these dependencies, he didn't have them explicitly called out, like uh, signals to, outcome, lock free, callable traits, and boost beast. They weren't explicitly called out in his uh, CMake lists, which I can show you. Uh, so this is his repository, and if we just go into example and look at his CMake lists, he called out boost cobalt, boost JSON, boost URL, and SSL, uh, but he didn't call out these others, and that's because he's executing his build inside the boost tree, so he has all those things, has all these other things available to him. Um, so my top level CMake lists. Um, I, this is uh, C++20, so we have to make sure that everything is compiled with requiring C++20. Uh, <coughs> I've included his, uh, this is the part that I, if I wanted to have that feature turned off, I should have had this be conditional to test against the CMake variable that VC package defines that says what uh, features you have selected. I didn't do that so it's kind of unconditional so if you turn that feature off it'll probably fail to build when it uh, goes down into here these cobalt examples but if we look at those so these are all my dependencies that I am I oh, have open SSL in there twice uh, these are all my dependencies that I need for building all the samples I just made a little helper function here that brought in the necessary libraries as uh, target link libraries. Um, I did find that when I was building that ticker example with MSVC that it brought in you know a whole bunch of template compiled things and then it overflowed some internal uh, section in the uh, portable executable file format you know if you bump into this once in a while and when you get the error message it tells you go rebuild it with slash big obj so that's what this is doing here um, I'm using what's called in CMake a generator expression so if my compiler ID is MSVC that expression highlighted turns into a one and then when I evaluate a generator expression with a one it picks this text and supplies it so this is only needed if I'm compiling with MSVC otherwise um, these other examples compile just fine um, and <coughs> you know we can take a look at like this really simple one the delay this is as we saw in the documentation that we are creating this timer we're gonna co-await on that timer asynchronously and then we're going to co-return from here and you notice there's nothing there's no actual main in here because we're defining this co-main and when we do that and include main HPPP from boost cobalt it'll supply an implementation of main for us to use so um, let's take a look at now 
at what I did to implement my um, so this is the same JSON coroutine client for querying this comics database the comics database is represented as a bunch of JSON files which you read in with SIMD JSON this is just a conversion of what we had last month to use boost cobalt so instead of having a main I have a co underscore main and if we uh, let's do this let's bring it up side by side so we can compare these just so you can see how they differ so here's my coroutine main from last month and you can see every place where I had a return here I've changed that to a co-return and this instead of being main it's co-main so otherwise all this code is the same instead of any any place I had a return I've changed that to a co-return and then uh, the one part that's different is over here I had this print matches factored out as a function that was saying as long as my low-level coroutine that I wrote myself as long as it was resumable I would go and get a match from it uh, th and this match generator type is my API interface for my coroutine which had the promise inside for cobalt you don't write your own client API the client API is supplied by the cobalt types boost cobalt generator boost cobalt task boost cobalt promise that defines the client API for clients of the coroutine so we'll get rid of this now so for me uh, I changed this to I've instantiated my coroutine because generators in cobalt are greedy it's already gone off and found the first value that it's going to return and what I did is I put it inside a std optional and you'll see why in a second so I co-await on my coroutine to get a value out of it that value is a std optional so if the std optional has something inside it then I'll go ahead and print what was inside the optional and you might ask yourself why did I need to do that optional I didn't have that last month when we just did it with low-level coroutines and the answer is maybe it's not the cleanest um, design choice to use std optional but I it's because I have this error checking in here that says if you give me an empty database I need to return and if we look at, uh, sorry, if we look at, let's close the, all of the others, and we look at coroutine, if we go inside here, this matches function. Okay, so inside here, due to the way that I customized the promise and the client API, I was able to co-return void and co-yield a different type down here now as far as I know you can't do that in cobalt so I have to co-return the same type as I'm co-yielding so that's why I wrapped it inside an optional so that I could return a value here it's the same type but it's an optional that doesn't have any nested value inside and same uh, here on the bottom I and I I think I have to have this down here instead of just empty because uh, I don't know if you saw but I, now I get a little blue squiggle up here saying you know cannot resolve to member blah 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 return void and that, that's because oops that's because in cobalt the API of the client class the, or the client API is defined by cobalt itself I don't get to I mean I guess I could you know write my own class that derives from this generator but it's not really they don't really intend for you to do that 
and I don't get to customize the nested promise type either. So it's it's a little bit different. Um, and like I said, maybe there's a better, um, you know, maybe there's a better design choice than what I did, but I just decided to wrap it inside as to it optional. Otherwise, all this other code is essentially the same as we had with low-level coroutines last month. Now, one thing I did find out that was interesting is if I build this code with release and then I try to run it, I get a crash. If I run it in debug, I don't get a crash. And if I run it with min size rel, which is a CMake build configuration that says build it release, but build it for minimum size as opposed to maximum performance. It also does not crash. And I don't think that's a bug in the Cobalt library. I think it's a bug in the coroutine support in MSVC. And even though coroutines showed up in C20 and MSVC had early, um, I don't know what you call it, prototype, technical specification, etc., for coroutines, they were one of the first compilers to implement coroutines. Um, I don't think, you know, every single possible crazy thing you can do with coroutines has been tested yet. And one thing that's different here with uh, Boost Cobalt, and, and it's entirely possible it's just a bug in my code. Um, I'm depending on SIMD JSON. I'm returning the, you know, these uh, things that go inside here, these are SIMD JSON objects. Uh, so it could be that I'm misusing the SIMD JSON objects and they're like going out of, uh, you know, technically their lifetime has expired while I'm still poking my fingers down into the JSON data structure. I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that the bug isn't mine, but it, I did notice that, you know, it would work in debug, it would crash and release, and it would not crash in min size rail. So I did find that interesting. I also, um, when I made a little GitHub workflow and pushed this code over to Ubuntu and had it running my unit tests on Ubuntu, I have some tests that crash with a seg fault in Ubuntu. Again, could be my bugs, but coroutine stuff is relatively new in the compiler support, so I, I haven't ruled out that it's not the compiler. Um, there's a lot of things with coroutines where you can get off into the just into the edge of undefined behavior and now you're doing something weird that's technically not supported and it may work in some build configurations with some compilers and may crash with others so something to be aware of uh, if you're gonna look at this uh, coroutine stuff um, does that mean you should stay away from coroutines no I think it just means you do a careful evaluation for your use case before you decide to adopt it. Um, I think if you're already using Boost ASIO for asynchronous operations and you've already sorted out all your lifetime issues, which Boost ASIO has its own set of lifetime issues you have to be aware of, as we saw. Most we, we saw that with uh, making sure that when we're doing HTTP uh, um, connections, that the sessions had a sufficient lifetime to extend across all of the asynchronous operations that were interacting with the session and that was done using a shared from this and using a shared pointer on the session it's not the only way you can guarantee that lifetime but it was a simple mechanism that was shown in the boost beast documentation so we just use that so um, can't guarantee that it's not my buggy code that's causing those crashes um, I've hacked around it in my tests so that <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of a cop-out I just I just took those tests and uh, if we're not running on Win32 I don't compile those tests so they just don't run on Linux uh, because they're the ones that crash I haven't I, I'm not quite sure what's wrong here and, and what was interesting it was the same tests would crash with low-level coroutines 
as would crash with cobalt. So that's kind of it. It, do, it doesn't narrow it down. Is the problem a cobalt bug? Is it a coverteen bug? Or is it my bug? It, it's hard to say. Um, uh, I did try to bring all these tests over to cobalt. These this is the coverteen. Um, version the low-level coroutine version of the tests where I'm asking the coroutine if it's resumable and then if it is I'm gonna get a match out of my client API um, and what I found with the equivalent tests for cobalt and again this just could be you can see I was trying to debug this here is get rid of these breakpoints um, this could just be user error. Uh, I want to uh, see if I can open a conversation with the author of this library, uh, Cobalt, to see if he, you know, it's going to be like, oh, here's what you're doing wrong. Um, so one thing that that is different for starters is my tests need an event loop, a handcrafted event loop. So I've got a ASIO context and in my setup function for each test case I am setting the cobalt executor for this thread to be the executor associated with my ASIO context and I need to do that so that I can execute these coroutine functions the, you know that are defined using these cobalt types to get these cobalt coroutines to execute at all. I have to set up this execution environment. Now if you go look at their implementation of main which is buried down in their cobalt header files you'll see that they also set up that memory allocator. I skipped that and I'm not sure if that's a mistake on my part or if, if, if I did what I did was acceptable but even with this that I've set up I can get the first value out of my generator but I can't seem to quite get the second so uh, down here I'm my test case is that I have only a single match so I'm expecting that if I ask my coroutine if it's ready to give me more values I'm expecting it to say false and that's true but up here where I've got multiple matches I should be able to ask it if it has if it's ready to give me more values and it should come back and say true but it it always came back false for me so I wasn't able to pump the second value out of my generator in a test case and uh, I honestly I it just feels like user error on my part um, I haven't completely gotten my head around all the machinery inside Cobalt to be able to figure out if it's definitively my fault or if I just uh, well, I think it, it's definitely a shortcoming in my test case um, do I need to pump the executor by calling you know boost ASIO context run or something I tried a variety of things to, to get the executor to, to pump some asynchronous events through the event loop the uh, boost ASIO executor it has you can say poll you can say run and you can say run one and I tried a variety of those and I couldn't got, get the second value pumped out of my coroutine so I, I suspect it's user error but um, this is another thing to remember that when you try out a library don't just try what it would look like in production code also try what it would look like to do it from a test make sure that whatever kind of tests you're writing are going to be able to work with this library as well um, so let's take a let's go take a look at this ticker example it's probably the most complicated example that he provides you can see like a whole bunch of boost ASIO and boost beast and boost JSON stuff is getting pulled in let's go down to the bottom and look at the co-main so um, 
setting up an acceptor to listen on port 8080 and then he's going to do a join uh, on run blockchain info here's he's using this uh, with helper to get um, to get uh, you know some tear down and basically what he's doing is saying as long as it wasn't canceled and we have not exhausted our session maximum section count go ahead and wait on a session and then we'll do w when the uh, sorry this gets a session going and then we can accept a connection and take that accepted connection and get a socket going by running a session on it the run session it's doing a wait on the the read so this is HTTP async read so it's waiting for an HTTP request then it's going to parse a URL out of the request uh, it needs to make sure the request has that special form so slash BTC slash USD that's this check against segment size not equal to um, if that's the case this is an error so it's going to report this error message back but it's going to do that asynchronously so here we're constructing the response that's all synchronous code you're just building a data structure in memory and then it's going to do an asynchronous wait on writing that data as the response then it will close the uh, connection and then co-return otherwise we got uh, good um, good input data on the request so now that we've um, he's this is uh, we're doing the accept And then I think this, uh, let's go back here. Okay, so this connection here is the local connection. Okay, so we are uh, doing async accept on the connection. We're going to read all the data out of the uh, am I reading this right I think yes okay so we're reading the uh, input request and then building a we built a JSON object and he's using a channel so it looks to me like um, there's another asynchronous routine that's communicating to the blockchain server that's got the data and we're going to use a channel by sending information across the channel which we do here and then we're going to read the value back from the channel which is going to be the in JSON oh no wait we're going to do JSON serialization of our input data into the remote service we write that out and then read back from where we're waiting until the connection uh, this uh, ST guy gets closed which is the web socket and then we'll close our layer and then a wait on P which is this read and close function which he's written here is doing the async read of the I believe this is reading the response back from the web socket as confusing as this may seem with all these co-awaits in here and all these uh, asynchronous operations flying it is clearer than 
the callback hell that we did with um, when we did it directly ourselves because we basically we've got a linear sequence of asynchronous operations here and so you can see everything that happens instead of chasing the code from callback to callback to callback to see what the next step is so that the steps are executed in this order it's just that they're asynchronous steps and he's using some helper functions so the the all you know not every single detail is made available here and you might have noticed there's these red squiggles here saying cannot resolve cannot resolve the coroutine promise type and you might think these are errors that we have to fix but no it's just IntelliSense barfing out because all this code compiles and works as expected and I was seeing some of this as I was developing uh, my little example and it was leading me astray to think that there was something incorrect about the code that I'd written if I uh, if I bring my output pane over here just so you can see oh it's a little too big we want it there okay so if I just go over here and I do control F7 to compile that file A lot of headers get included that expand a whole bunch of templated stuff, so it's not exactly the fastest build in the world. Also, I'm doing min size rail. I haven't switched it back to debug. But it compiles with no warnings and no errors. So this is a bit of a leading us astray. Yeah, no problems. Um, it's also weird that over here, it's colored in turquoise and then over here it's colored in purple so there's definitely something going on with the IntelliSense here that it's it's not completely correct um, which can be a bit of a nuisance if you are used to IntelliSense giving you information about what you've done wrong you can see over here in the gutter it's highlighted all these things as red er red errors um, but they're not actually errors they're perfectly fine so, um, bottom line, let's go back over here. Um, I think this library succeeds in what it tries to do, to give you sim simple, single-threaded asynchronicity akin to Node.js and AsyncIO and Python. I think it succeeds there, but while it does make some policy choices for you with respect to the client API, that is returned by your coroutine function and the underlying promise type so that you don't have to worry about writing the low-level functions that say when you when your coroutine can be suspended and when it you know what how are expressions in a co yield statement mapped to the ultimate value returned by the um, you know a co-await or co-yield it ultimately has to be turned into an awaiter and so on you don't have to worry about those details but it's still asynchronous IO and you have to or, or asynchronous operations and so you have to think carefully about the asynchronous operations in flight and make sure that you're um, overlapping things in a manner that's useful and makes sense it doesn't it doesn't you know doesn't solve those problems for you, which you would have those same problems in Node.js or AsyncIO in Python. So it's not like this is a problem unique to C++. Um, it's just asynchronous programming. You need to think about things carefully in order to get the benefit. Of, you know, it's it it is more complicated than single-threaded, straight-line executed code. But if we are using, uh, let's go back over here. If we are using a higher level library like COBOL, we, we get, you know, straight line execution of our asynchronous recipe that reads like sequential code that was synchronous. Um, and I'll just mention here something that you may not have known. It's been around since uh, definitely C++11. Maybe, I think it might have been there in C++98 as well. But you might not have known that, um, you notice here, he's got the function declaration and then immediately the try keyword and then the body of the function 
followed by a catch block. And when I looked at that in it, <laughs> when I looked at that at first, I was like, wait, is that valid syntax? And it turns out for a function or a member function, yes, you can, if, if the whole thing is going to be encapsulated in a try catch block, you can have that without having to wrap the whole thing inside another curly brace scope. It's, it's perfectly, oops, let's undo that. It's perfectly valid to do that. That was something, you know, C++ is one of those languages where you just keep learning things that have been around forever and didn't realize that was a thing you could do. Uh, so one less layer of curly braces if your function is going to be wrapped in a try-catch anyway. You might also just get rid of it and just use the, the try-catch right at the outermost nesting level. So, Yeah, for the recording, the question was, if you put the extra curly brace in, does it fix the IntelliSense confusion? And it looks like it does. So, although this co-return is still written in a different color than co-await. These are, these are keywords. They should all be colored the same. I don't know why co-await here is colored like a function or a type. Uh, but yeah, it got rid of the squiggles, didn't it? Isn't that interesting to know? So there's the bug for the squ where the squiggles are coming from. It's because it didn't recognize this uh, kind of naked try catch as the body of a function. So um, I would say I would file a bug on Visual Studio, but for 10 years I've been filing bugs and they they close them all without doing anything. So honestly, I'm sorry to say I'm not going to bother. Uh, I've been trying to get in contact with somebody on LinkedIn that uh, so I can get rid of these useless QA people in the middle to try and get my Visual Studio gripes resolved, but the guy won't connect with me on LinkedIn, so oh well. Uh, anyway, overall, I think uh, Boost Cobalt's a good library. The documentation is, is pretty good. It's got, like I said, a few minor typos here and there. Uh, I've opened GitHub issues on those that I noticed. Um, and uh, even though English is not his, I, I believe, is not his first language, it, the documentation reads pretty well. Um, I think it, like any library that's complex, uh, if you're very familiar with coroutines as a, as a technology domain, then, you know, this documentation is quite fine. Um, if you're new to coroutines, I think the documentation could benefit from some additional examples but you know every that's pretty much true for every library right it could always use more examples um, I can't say that any of the problems that I ran into were the library's fault I honestly I'm gonna accept the blame myself for whatever crashy tests I have or things that I, I wasn't able to achieve like pumping multiple values out of my generator um, I'm just gonna lay that all on user error um, and it's, you know, when I was younger, I was eager to blame the compiler, but having so far never actually found a compiler bug in many, many years, now I'm more humble and just, I just assume it's always my code. But, um, oh, one thing we haven't shown you is running the code. So let's go over here and we will build our tool as min size rel so it doesn't crash and go over here to my command prompt go to my build directory if I could spell build oh, wrong one and we go here to tools and go to min size rel so here's my executable comics cobalt and my JSON is laying around in again spelling is laying there and we'll search for script credits matching 
Gruen, which is going to match Mark Grunewald. Now if we run that, so here we're pumping the code in, or the uh, JSON into memory with SIMD JSON, and then we're using the generator to get all the matching values one by one, printing them out, of which there's a bunch, because Mark Grunewald wrote a ton of stuff. Hopefully it's not going to crash at the end. I haven't run it all the way to the end. We'll find out. Overall, I would give this library a good plus. If you're interested in using coroutines, it's definitely going to simplify some things for you. Coroutines being fairly newly implemented feature, and I don't think tons of people are using them. So there may be some wigginess with the compiler. Um, like I said, I'm just going to assume. Let's try this. Let's kill that. Let's see one that I think is going to be shorter. see if it's going to crash at the end. Maybe that wasn't shorter. Anyway, this repository, I've got it uploaded onto GitHub. You can compare the low-level coroutines version with the Cobalt-enabled version. Uh, and other than using the different APIs to implement the coroutine functionality, they're, they're the same, so I guess I picked another bad example. It's too many credits. Um, one thing I will also mention before we wrap up is that by default, the execution context created by boost cobalt when you use the co underscore main it sets it up so that asynchronous operations can be canceled by uh, control C. So um, this here, you know, it's been canceled because of request to blah, 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 blah. That's me typing control C and it's saying, oh, I received a control C signal. So I'm going to cancel all the um, coroutines that are in flight and return back out of co underscore main or return back out of the helper function that's invoking co underscore main. Um, so that is kind of nice. Um, and, you know, because it's boost open source, you can, of course, see how that main helper function is implemented and how all those mechanisms are uh, implemented, how the poly cho policy choices are chosen. And you're not required to use that uh, default executor that sets things up in that way. Uh, you can supply your own executor. It just has to conform to the requirements of an executor concept. It's all explained in the documentation, and it's really just using the executor concept as it exists in Boost ASIO. So um, it, it's not a new concept to this library. And that's going to wrap it up for this month. Thanks for being here.